Hi, my name is Jules Lund and this is Uncommon. Uncommon is a production by Neural, a unique digital agency. Neural specializes in content production in the areas that matter most to your content strategy across podcast production, video production, and social media. If you want to increase your conversion or grow your brand trust, head to neural.com to request a callback. That's N E U R A L E dot com. My name's Jordan Michaelides, and I'm the host of Uncommon, a show that asks the why on business, current affairs, media, and sport. If you like this episode, do of course like and subscribe. This will help the YouTube algorithm work out whether you like this type of content. To find all previous guests, just head to neural.com slash uncommon. For podcast audio, search Uncommon on all your good podcast apps, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. For social, keep up to date with behind the scenes at Uncommon underscore show. With all that being said, let's get into the episode. My guest this week is Jules Lund, presenter, MC, former broadcaster, founder of Tribe, an influencer marketing platform. Jules, uh, thanks for doing this. I know you don't do too many of these interviews these <laughs> days. Um, <laughs> I was, uh, I reached out to Tommy and the boys. Uh, I tried finding some dirt. Um, I feel like you've pretty much put it all out there over the years, but I did have to ask, like, do you think if you ever got a call up again from channel nine that you would do uh, any of the adults only 20 to one or any of the, the old 20 to one uh, performance gigs? Um. Well, I don't know. I, I did, are they still playing 20 to 1, are they? <laughs> I, don't, no. I don't think so. I don't no. Think so. No, look, probably, I don't know. I haven't watched Channel 9 for a little while, but yeah. um, if they rang me up and offered me anything, I mean, the answer would be yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I'll take, I'll, I'll take anything. But um, no, I'm joking. I... Uh, I wouldn't have taken the SAS on Channel 7 with Merrick and uh, Merrick Watts and uh, Chappelle Corby and a few of those guys because that would be too brutal. But, um, yeah, I do uh, I do like TV and I, yeah. I've got unfinished business there. Uh, I don't want to live in TV, but I do want to present uh, a big show, um, but I would probably remain in radio, if anything. So. Okay. Um, even though I, I've got a tech company right now, um, it's not actually in my sweet spot. Yeah. Um, it's just that I'm a bit of an opportunist and uh, I like trying new things. But as you get older and you try new things, the best thing is that you get to compare them back to some of the previous ventures. And so far over the course of my life, probably the most fun and rewarding thing I've ever done is uh, running life coach sessions out in secondary schools, I, I found that to be phenomenal and loved it and, and, and yet to get back to that same sense of elation after one of those sessions because you're actually making a difference but it's still fun. And then I think for that's a, a balance of sort of spirit and fun but a, ba- a balance of fun and money, funny money, is, uh, is radio. But then, yeah. And then a balance of just taking the piss was getaway where they'd pay me to fly around the world business class and, and do cool stuff. So, yeah. Do you, do you think that if you were to get back into TV, at least with Channel 9, that have a prerequisite of you bringing the, um, the classic blonde tips back? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? Um, towards the end, towards the end, so I was either 15 years too early or 15 years too late, but either way, the bleach blonde hair, It was a phenomenal statement, not a good one, but it was a statement. And um, and so I did ten years travelling the globe on on getaway, and that uh, that hair. um, There was a there was a time where everyone was saying you've got to get rid of it, and I would tell them that um, getaway, which it does, it filmed out of order, and so you could film something Uh. twelve months ahead. And so it would be a real problem to get rid of it for them. And they'd express <laughs> that to me as well. <laughs> However, that was my excuse, but deep down, I still really loved it. Yeah. I really loved it. And in fact, I would wish I could get away with it now, but 
you know, I'm a bit older and that's a bit humiliating. I've got to ask you, I know you're an 80s kid, technically. You're born 79, but an 80s kid. Is there any particular early memories you've got from your childhood at all? Yeah, um, loads. Uh, I was obsessed with branding. How so? Um, well, Amer- what America represented to me and the commercialism through, funnily enough, branding. Like it's only now that, because I love branding, right? So I mm-hmm. love, I think I created most of the things I've created was just so I could create a business card for myself that had the logo <laughs> and, and, look, and the letterhead. Like for me, a new venture was, is, was pa- the lick of paint. Yeah. And I've always loved it. Um, and now I'm in branding and I really care about it. I don't get to play as much on that side of it. But um, when I was, you know, I collected, I had a Coke collection. In, st- in fact, I still have it. It's probably worth thousands and thousands of dollars but um i was obsessed with the this iconic imagery i was also obsessed with um you know things like la dodgers and and raiders hats and and i had an american flag that you had to walk through to get into my bedroom and so i was a really yeah I, i that's they're my memories and nike pumps and it was just I was just and and also there's still the chewing gum like big red and all this stuff that my oh yeah big red wow my my friends my my parents friends would come back from America and just bring us a bag of stuff from the shop and it was like it was the cool it was a portal into the cool world that you get to watch on um you know Teen Wolf and did, um, did you grow up in you grew up in Melbourne right yeah did you ever go to the American food store in Bentley. No, but but I know what you mean. We, I, I think when um, Daimar Roo opened yeah, yeah, yeah. Melbourne Central, they had an American food area and I think it was all around um, what were the things that you could get in there that you couldn't get at home? Um, I suppose it was like Nerds, um, which was just sugar coated in sugar and... <laughs> And like the um, the warheads, you know, the chili and and sour warheads, which you can still get, and you know, my kids walk home from Seven Eleven with all that sort of stuff. So now I never saw the the, but but I but I still like even when I go over now, I find myself walking down the like the pharmacy CVS, looking at the all the different types of M and M's. Like I'm still fascinated at the caramel M and M's and the peanut butter M and M's, and I usually bring that stuff back and the Hershey's and the Kisses for the the tribe crew. I remember uh, this store was owned. So I went to this primary school in Bentley and then when oh, we moved hang out of on. You don't, oh no, you don't mean that the horse one with the big horse on um, Danny Nong Road near the end nah. of Glenfrey um, because it was a horse talk or something. It was another big one that had all that candy. Anyway, go on. No, it was parallel to Bentley Station. Um, I can't remember. I think it was just called USA Foods. Um, and I remember it was a kid that I went to school with, but I'd left that school because we'd moved suburbs over the years. And um, I would always go back and his mum was always at the front of the store and they just had the best shit. Cause I, I was a, a bit of a brands guy as well, but I found USA food so foreign and so fascinating. And I would just spend, that's what I would do. I'd, I'd work at the chemist delivering medicine for old people. So you were, then, you were a drug trafficker. A drug courier, yeah. Um, and then I'd ride up to Bentley over the weekend and see what I could buy from USA Foods, and it was Big Red. Big Red was the best thing. I'd, I used to buy one for me, and I'd buy one to sell on the playground at uh, lunchtime because people would pay like a dollar for a piece of Big Red. So you were a hustler. So how much were you getting paid for your drug run? Uh, nothing. It was back in... What year was it? Like 2000, maybe 2001. I was about 12, 12-ish then. You probably, I probably got about ten dollars, ten Aussie dollars. I used to. I would go to John Button Pharmacy on High Street, Ashburton, and I would, um, I would do it for two dollars. They'd give me a two dollar coin, but I was like a lot. I was like nine or ten, and they'd just give me the addresses, all the old biddies. Yeah, yeah. And I'd ride around. But the other thing that I did a lot earlier than that, in terms of the hustle was I used to go to 7-Eleven and 7-Eleven they'd have the stickers, like piles of the Triple M Rocks, Colin oh, yeah. 
Triple M Rocks, Carlton, Triple M Rocks, uh, Richmond Tigers. And I would just get, because it was free, and I'd just get the whole pile and then I'd sell them at school. Um, and it was awesome. I used to sell so much stuff at school. Yeah. Um, and I was the kid that never had anything brand new, but there were also other kids that never had anything brand new. And you could almost wear your Nikes and sell them even though you'd already worn them because there'd be other kids that were just so happy to have something with a Nike swoosh. And I was the same with, because I was the fourth of four kids and I never got anything new. I just got hand-me-downs and they could have been from mum's friend's dead dad. You know, like dad dies, here's a bag of stuff. Um, and I'd wear it because it would have like Adidas you know, logo on it. But as I said, I was obsessed with these brands, but I'd, I would unstitch the Stussy things in my brother's, you know, the back label of their Stussy oh. shorts and I'd unstitch them and then I'd get the Target ones and I'd stitch the back fit that had the logo on it on the <laughs> front like down as a, and cut it so it looked like it was Stussy things. But I was, it was That's just so a, funny. Yeah. I, 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 um, we, I was, I think about it now. We weren't, we went to a private school, but we had scholarships mainly because of my brother. My brother's a fucking genius and he got a hundred percent scholarship. I got some sort of discount and, and I, I was there. So, and my parents could not afford all the, um, it was a Brighton grammar, all the extra things that people got and people would have like $50 notes at like 12 or 13 going to the tuck shop for lunch. And so, yeah, I'd sell those things like the big red, but actually my, when it really did really well was I noticed that people actually didn't like the tuck shop food because it was all like, it was pizzas and hot dogs and stuff like that. And it's cool for the first, you know, uh, semester, but then you're immediately over it. And so my parents, like with a, with a sort of European background would make me Nice sandwiches like salami, prosciutto, mozzarella, rocket. Ladies, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> essentially, and I would say I I was small, like I'm still short. I'm five eight, but I was probably tiny back then in comparison to everyone. I said to mum, oh, "I'm really hungry. Can you make me double?" And so she'd make another one, and I'd sell that other one for like ten, fifteen dollars. And then I or I'd sell both of them in some cases, and I, I would go buy the tuck shop food yeah. with the money that I made. I, would, I don't know if you could do that anymore. Like, I feel like you get pulled up at, at schools. I would, um, they called it scabbing. So I was at yes, D.L. College and I would, just, I would just flat out be begging out the front of the tuck shop and scab five cents, 10 cents, up until I got 65 cents and then yep. I'd have the giant Freddo. Um, <laughs> and people would, there'd be coins down drains and, and I would spend... Like I'd be bringing contraptions to get like the 20 cent coin out the front of the tuck shop in the drain. So I was a massive tight ass. The best hustles I had around my hood was um, uh, we taught the, the, the neighbor's golden retriever to be a golf ball retriever. And so down at East uh, uh, Malvern Valley Golf Course, where my folks still live alongside, um, we would be hidden in Gardner's Creek and then there would be a curving golf course and, um, and the ball would come around the corner and would get the dog to just go up there and bring it back and then would hide and they'd lose their golf ball and stuff and then would go to the other tee and just sell their golf balls back to them and would be swimming in the dams and would pull out, like up near the, the, the clubhouse, there was just one tee off that just literally just went into a dam. And you could go in there and you just feel the bottom and it was like a ball pit. And so yeah. you just get them all out and we sell them there. And then the other one was we had um, we had car wash out the front of our house. So $3, get your car wash. We'll be screaming out the front with the neighbours and all that sort of stuff. But little do they know that we would take mum's vacuum cleaner bag and, and just litter most cars the night before all around the neighbourhood, just, you know, just like this pixie dust. Um, so they'd wake up and go, yeah, my car probably does need a bit of a wash. And then we'd go, and we had to stop that when we were going, car wash, and two cars came down the hill from different directions and they just slammed into each other because they were both listing and freaked out by these kids out on the on the pavement. And these cars just imploded and we went, time to wrap it up, I think. Where where do you think this came from? Like did your parents own a business? What, what was sort no, of? No, not at all. Not, not entre- entrepreneurial at all. I mean, they were renovators and they would make money that way, but they weren't hustlers like that. No way. No, it was just being without. So like you, I was just sitting there at school and just going, those kids have got stuff I don't have. Like I used to, 
mate, all the way up to, like I was, I mean, some people would say just a scam artist, but uh, I was pretty dishonest too. Like in these days I was, you know, I was shoplifting heaps, right? We would, we would, um, yeah, I'd lift heaps of stuff. But um, the, the concession cards, so what I would do is I would go and pay my mate $5.60 to get him to say he lost his concession card and then get a new one and then I would use it. And it would be worth 200 bucks a year to catch all the... So I would... It wasn't just oh, being... Yeah, I, yeah. I was just saying to mum and dad, you don't have to give me money for transport. But I, there was no way I was going to pay for trains and trams to school and buses every day. So every year, at the start of the year, a friend who would look like me, I'd go up and say, right, here's your five bucks sixty to get a replacement card, and then I'd just take his and, and use it for the entire year. Yeah, that was the that was the day of uh, Met cards. Well, no, so what's the, the little blue? The little blue. Uh, t- I mem I remember those concession or annual passes. They were like yeah. gold. Yeah, they were. Yeah, and then when I didn't have friends, that I'd lift them. You know, I would. Uh, <laughs> Oh, they said I was, my teacher uh, explained that I was a, a polite thief. Because a polite I, thief, yeah. I, I, I would just, I just would lift, uh, uh, just, I'd leave all the cash and stuff and I just lifted just the, the concession card because I knew that the kid could get it. But it was awkward as because one time at the, um, you know, the, uh, it's South Bank, we went to, um, I don't know what they call it. What do they call it when they have the universe on the roof and you all look at it and learn about the star? Um, astronomy. Stargazing? Like, I mean, yeah. it is, we it is astronomy. Those, and I lay back and my wallet fell out of my pocket and there I had Jules Lund on everything and then I had this other kid's name on my concession cards. So I was in the playground and I heard, would this kid and this kid please come to the office? And I thought the only time I'm ever associated with that other kid is in my wallet. Like, I don't even know that other kid. So I was sprinting towards the office and the teacher was just so confused by this wallet that was handed in with two names. So I just quickly grabbed it. But I had to apologise to the kid at my 10-year reunion because I said, P.S., that was me. And he goes, P.S., I know. (laughs) (laughs) You know what's so funny? I was going to go to DLA or CBC and the only – my parents changed their mind as soon as my brother got a scholarship to write in grammar. Mate, I was at – so it, out of primary school, they were, the, they were the options for people that didn't have a ton of money, right? Yeah. And so it was CBC or, or DLA. And, and sadly, it was actually pretty tricky to get into DLA. So a lot of my mates went to CBC. And look, CBC, I don't know if you've seen it lately, but, you know, some of their fences along the edges are covered in what looks like uh, Claude Van Damme's, Jean-Claude Van Damme's um, uh, fighting mitts. You know, it's the concrete with the broken glass wedged in. You know what you sometimes see in, that was the protection. I don't know if that was to keep the kids in or the crims out or vice versa, but but it was pretty pretty rough. Like I remember going to Moomba, which is like the carnival in Melbourne, and, and mate, the CBC kids would be going around getting stabbed or stabbing. Like it was like, (laughs) it was loose. So DLA was one step up and I only got in there because my older brothers, but I do remember that in year eight there was scholarships going and I, I, one of my mates did get one at Xavier and I agree. Oh, yeah. If you could get lift, if you could get scholarship airlifted out of one of those schools yeah. and you just didn't have to do anything, you're bluffing all that hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, uh, he pretty much pulled me out of there, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, I remember doing the scholarship test at Xavier and Mentor and Grammar. Uh, my parents just like, just like I, I remember... In hindsight, it is so stupid that I did those tests because I did no work or study leading up to the test. My parents were just like, hey, uh, this Saturday, just uh, the morning, you're going to go to this thing at this school and you're going to do a test. I'm like, oh, okay. And that was on the Monday and it was that Saturday. And then- just, it was sort of free and they're throwing it at the wall. But that's a compliment because they genuinely thought you were smart. Little did they know that you would fail. <laughs> Pretty much. But also, like, the competition there is intense. Like, oh. I remember the one at Xavier. I was in this room. I was overwhelmed because, I, you know, growing up, growing up in Bentley, we might have had maybe 60 people in my year level at a maximum, you know, maybe 500 people max in the school. In the tests that I was doing, they were just testing for year seven, and there was, like, 600 people in there. 
it was insane. All lined up in desks. I'll I'll never forget it because I remember sitting there and going like, "What the fuck is this?" Like, <laughs> it was yeah. It was it is your worst nightmare. So my daughter's just turned ten, uh-huh. and I've been trying to because it's hard to get the kids into high school. So I, I've taken her to two scholarships, and you turn up with these scholarships, and um, unfortunately she she didn't pass um, those. But um, but I you know we did some tests leading up. And I was really cautious not to build it up because I didn't want her to go, I failed it. I did, in fact, I didn't even tell her that she didn't get through. I just didn't tell her that she did, obviously. And um, But you go out there and, look, the international students, you're up against people that need to get a foothold into this, yeah. um, this country and it means so much to their family. And to be honest, yeah. they're smarter and more deserving. But, but you know, like... I, the I fam- to, family's I, betting on it as well. I went to one and it was just like, the intense. international students would, was 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 and and the, what they would the drills that they would have gone through and yeah. there's my daughter and I was thinking, mate, no chance. Yeah, Unless these kids have been training for four years just for yeah. this test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and you know and that, that's exactly how society should be. It should be equal weighting. Put yeah. the effort in. Um, uh, speaking of tests, uh, fifteen days of fame. I feel like this is sort of your segue into what you actually did i know you studied graphic design photography f- film we said we spoke about dlar before you actually competed with a former guest of ours prue corrigan uh who runs oh, yeah. one day dream pr um she was, she was prue murphy at the time it was she yeah prue prue murphy um i think you got into this you you called up you're in your valiant cries and you talk some shit about uh, like you're at reach of the point, but the story goes that you and your mate went on this tour through the US and instead of going to theme parks, you went to talk shows and then the lady called you up afterwards. She's obviously probably like one of the producers. Um, and so you got you got in there and then after that, it's you're doing this time slot. I was listening to actually, I listened to the entirety of your interview with Craig. No, I read the transcript which is very interesting. I prefer reading the transcripts as opposed to listening to the interviews because you, you sort of see where some emphasis can be in the writing and it takes out a lot of, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's different and it's really easy to process. But um, this guy, Craig, was really into what you guys were doing and so you and Sam do this show at 10.30 at night for two years, I think. Yeah. It was essentially like an early stage podcast. Um. I got to ask, like, what what did you like about storytelling? I mean, it's obvious from the story about reach that you'd like to captivate people, but what what did you get from that? Did, it was it just as simple as being liked? Yeah, yeah. It was as simple as having attention. Yeah, and commanding a room, but also, you know, Jim Steins was the master at commanding an audience, and this is Jim Steins, who's sort of you know former football Brownlow medalist and. Um, you know, he's passed away, sadly, um, since. But, he, you know, Irish guy, kid, comes out here at 18 and, and you know, has probably more impact on... He was a Victorian of the year so many times. He's just, mm. you know, looking at his funeral and it was a national st- or state funeral and just saying how many people. Just awesome, awesome. But I, I just watched I just watched how he, he could have people in the palm of his hands and take them on a real true um, journey. And so... Um, I was trying to get, uh, get attention in negative ways through school and, and he very quickly said, you know, I realised, oh, no, you can, if you actually try to help people, not only do you get attention but um, they might, they, you feel, you feel good. good. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's all just completely and utterly um, uh, self-serving. Yeah. Most of the shit I've done in my life has, you know, most, most of the things that people do are self-serving. It's just yeah. some people's choices um, transform other people's lives in the positive along the way. But, you know, um, so, I mean, the Reach Foundation and, and you know, I'd drive around and run these school workshops and, and that was that was stunning. Um, but the 15 days of fame uh, was just purely indulgent. You know, I wanted fame and fortune. I was sort of 21 and I'd travelled through and seen how Jerry Spring and Ricky Lake and all these other you know, people overseas um, were just getting paid for mucking around and being stupid. And I thought, well, that looks pretty good. So I came back from that trip and thought I'll get an agent and try the same. And that's when I, I'd sort of got a, a um, I'd, I'd, I'd won the audition of a, a kid's show with Ed Maguire 
um, and Maguire Media. Um, mm. It never came off. So we'd done the pilots and then, yeah, I was driving out to one of the workshops and I, and I rang up and was banging on about the stupid adventures. And funnily enough, um, yeah, Mel Murphy, uh, another Murphy at the time, she's now still producing like, um, you know, uh, Monty uh, and Yumi and, and Beck Jard. And, yeah, and yeah. She's a superstar, right? So she's still in the bizzo, as is Craig, you know, uh, Craig Bruce on Game Changers uh, Radio. But, um, yeah, they just gave me an opportunity and, and you know, I was up against Prue and, um, and another, uh, another person called Lisa. And, look, you know, they, they sadly, the, they were superstars, but they didn't stand a chance because <laughs> I, I was just absolute hustle. I had no idea... You know, I, I don't even think I've told anyone this, but my, my wife and I, I'm, I'm, she's my wife now, but, you know, my first girlfriend t- 20 years ago, you know, she, she and I were just writing fan mail and faxing it in how, how amazing Jules is. And I'm just, <laughs> I was writing it going, oh, my God, if Jules does this. And uh, they, they still talk about, oh, my God, there was this. It was just us. We just going to it. Yeah, and uh, that goes back to where that skill set and that, uh, that hustle at the early age really came into into your favour. It's it's just one of those things. Yeah, I'm less. I do it now, but I'm less dishonest, I suppose. Yeah, I think. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of similarities we have as individuals. I think the wanting to be liked by people is something I align with for sure. I think that's. Uh, but, but that. No, but don't, yeah, but I mean. So like we all we all have that, but it, it's it's more in the social sense. You're intrigued by people, and it makes you, I don't know. There, there's there's something about there's some energy you get from it that that you fit. Like I always felt that I really fed off the room when I could sort of act off in yeah. class, like and be a shithead. I remember my French teacher told me she was leaving in year eight. She was told me she was leaving our school because of me in class, and I fucking love that. I was just like, yes. <laughs> It was, it was a win, but yeah. look, it's it's sadly it's 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 validation. I mean, you and I are inadequate. That's why. I mean, we we always felt like we missed out. Even how you describe it, you just yeah. we just felt like we fucking missed out. We didn't want to miss out. Yeah. So we just we that's that's just our that's our um, our strategy to taking what we feel we rightfully deserve because we have you know healthy egos. And um, we're like, no, nah, I want that. And I'm still doing it. Mm. Like, you know, even I was thinking about validation the other day, you know, I still am looking for validation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 41. It's, yeah. um, Do you find that you can't take a compliment well? Do you struggle to take a compliment? Like, do you feel uneasy when people compliment you? Yeah, I do. I, I want the compliment. I just don't want to be present. Yeah, you just don't want to hear it. No, I want to hear it, but from afar. I don't want yeah, to yeah, it. yeah. You don't want to have to react. To, I can't, I can't deal with compliments. Like as in, I, I like it in a group setting, and it makes me smile. But um, I also feel super awkward about it. It's this weird, weird little dichotomy. Um, I don't know if Jace Hawkins has got that as well. Uh, when we interviewed him, and I, I always give him shit about it, but uh, he's quite similar in that regard. He's a big softy, but he can't take a compliment. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's 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 a fantastic because he's look. I mean, we t- I, I laugh and talk about our ego and stuff, but the reality is, we're we're also we're being an open book and at least allowing yourself to be vulnerable. I, I like that. Like I like people like Jace because even he's got no ego. If you yeah, like, there's yeah. a lot of there's actually a lot of broadcasters, you know. And, Labby, lab rat. I remember me, me and him were the only ones with bleach blonde hair in the day. Um, but he was a he was a superstar, and um, I mean, he's still a superstar. But my point is, at his age, and and how um, he would just grab opportunities. I, I remember watching him at Rumba, just in front of you know thousands of people, just doing TV presenting better than any. I mean, I'd never done TV presenting, but just at the camera and just such a natural. But you know, that's what I love most about the Australian industry because there's not a lot of wankers. And when you are no. a wanker, you, you, you're, you're in the minority and um, it's such a – do you know what I laugh about 
because I've got a fr- an Aussie guy who worked at Pinterest, right, over in the US. He's been over there for 10 years and he still remembered me. I think he'd come back and he's like, what's so funny about um, uh, people with a profile in Australia is if you become a celebrity, you stay a celebrity, like just forever. Like he goes, <laughs> he comes back and he sees Molly Meldrum and all the, you know, for 20 years they've just been, whereas in America you're something and then you just fall off the perch because there's thousands more stealing the attention, yeah. evolving. Whereas here, if you were on fucking um, Hey Hey It's Saturday, you know, 30 years ago, like Wilbur Wilder, you just you just Still set. relevant. Yeah. You just, once you've established, you just set because people don't forget and there's no one taking your place. Well, I you know, I had a conversation with um, a comedian the other day about why Australian politics is never like American politics and it goes back to this cultural element. We just don't like, we, we don't take dickheads very long, if that makes sense. We're not as polarised as they are in the US or as polarising, um, I find, because we're so egalitarian and we just don't, like, because if someone does something, we'll just take the shit out of them. You know, yeah, we'll just take the piss be, out of them. They'd have to be really you know, really struggle with intelligence to not read the room. Yeah. And that's where I, where I laugh around Pauline Hanson because she's probably the exception yeah. to all that. Yeah. And she just, she can't, she just doesn't have that extra capacity to read the room, which is fantastic fodder for all of us. Oh, it's, it's great for us. Like, actually, you know, I was thinking of a recent one. Do you remember the, the, the lady who was walking around the town? She says, oh, well, I've done all of Brighton. Yeah, yeah. So she's created a profile on Instagram. She's got like 30,000 followers now. Yeah, I and think her she, son's doing it. Her son's pushing it. He, she is hilarious. Like she is taking it in her stride. She makes songs. And you start to realize now that when she said what she said, she was obviously saying it sarcastically. But people uh, just didn't. Really? Yeah, yeah. 100%. I'm very sure. If you look at the profile, you get that sense after after watching it that she's very sarcastic and actually very, very funny. And the way it was clipped on Channel 9, she looked like an asshole. Oh, so it was, it, it's, it's very, very funny. Uh, I think her profile is called The Official Karen from oh. Brighton. And uh, it's, it's so funny. Um, um, great. I, I love that. I, yeah, I really, really like. She drinks VBs and shit. Like she's, mm. uh, she's one of the Grollo uh, kids, yeah. apparently. So, um, anyway, you've you've had quite a fabled uh, TV and radio career. Um, I remember listening to you. Me and my mum were obsessed with Fifi and Jules on the <laughs> radio, and my dad never liked it. He was always a Triple M guy. You know, he'd, he'd love Eddie Maguire, but he never liked the show. And then eventually it, we turned, my sister and my brother really got onto the show. And I was, I was sad that it only went for the, the few years that it did. Um, I know you obviously had Getaway for a period there. You were like the guy on Channel 9, presented the Logies. You did fucking it. If you go through your actual um, filmography on Wikipedia, there's so many random shows oh, yeah. that Ch- Channel 9 were trying to obviously just test. And you'd be the go-to. The go-to I, was cannon, I was cannon fodder. It was <laughs> one much. point I was the only real host there, like yeah. you know, because Ed became the boss, and then Jamie Jury defected to seven, and then it felt like there was a period where it's just like, hey, we've got to do three shows this year, Jules. You're doing them, and I'd be going, they're horrible shows, <laughs> and they'd say, no, no, you've got to do them. And I'm like. I, you know I'm going to go down with each one of those ships, and sure enough, I did. What, like, what, how does that work then? From a like when they approach you on that, do they say, "Hey, we're going to pay you extra for doing this," no. but you also have to do it, or is it just like you're contracted to be a presenter with yeah. them, and they're like, "Well, we need you to pick up some more hours on this and fill fill no, some space." Look, it's a good question. So basically, they pay you a heap, right, for a network contract over the year, and so I always had getaway, and that was like. That was unusually stable, right? You, there's no sort of, nothing really exists like that these days where, you know, it was just always there. And so I, I was, you know, able to spend quite a bit of time with that. So I would have that as my sort of um, staple, but then I was able to step off and trial all these other things. The other things, they'd still have to pitch to me. So they didn't pay me extra, 
because, you know, I, I wanted to work nonstop. Like I absolutely loved it. But um, but I didn't like the concept. So, mm. you know, I, I still cared about, nah, I still had a content brain. I was like, nah, that's shit. And so, you know, they would pitch me like, um, what was it, dancing on ice, you know, learning how to um, <laughs> uh, ice dance with Torval and Dean. Yeah. Reality show. And they said, do you want to do this? I said, nah. And they said, have a look at the video. I said, yeah. It, it's sparkly and spandex and I said, I'll host it. And they said, we've got jury. And I said, well, no. And then after a while, the pressure just comes. And so I caved to that and it ended up being a good thing anyway. But then off the back of that, I, you know, because I'd taken the piss out of it, um, it, it struck a chord and then I was hot property. And then from there, unfortunately, they had a whole heap of shit shows and, and I said no to plenty, but also um, the ones that I, like hole in the wall was where yeah, yeah. There's you a would stand to that. there, yeah. you'd stand there on the edge of a pool and they'd have a, card, uh, a polystyrene cutout and if you didn't make the shape, the, the wall would push you in the pool and it was, yeah. it was fucking stupid. It was, it was a Japanese uh, clip yeah. on YouTube that should have stayed as a clip, not a you know, eight part series. Yeah. That, that is a classic case of like a network goes to that annual conference in France. I can't remember where it is, where they, Nipcom. they trade or what is it? Nipcom. That's it. Yeah. And they trade the shows or they buy the rights to shows in the territory. Um, Cause I got two mates who just sold a show called regular old Bogan to channel seven. And they were going to go through that process this year, but obviously COVID happened and they were just telling me about it. And I'm just like, okay, right. So they really, when it comes to content, there's not much original stuff on networks these days. And that to me stood out as a TV show. I feel like Labby actually might have hosted that for a period as well. Which but one? I, uh, Hole in the Wall. No. He, or he was just on an episode. He was on an episode. Um, we looked similar back then. So I can uh, <laughs> Well, how many seasons do you reckon friggin' ran, mate? It, it didn't even, it was eight apps and it struggled towards. So what happened was, I said no to that and they kept coming out. And I, I can't even begin to tell you how the, the, the heat that I got on that over months. To I, I can't, In the end, I went, if I say no to this and it goes well, I'm cooked at this network, right? Because that was, I didn't get on the bus, it went well. And if it goes bad, I'll be blamed because I wasn't helping and being a team player. Yeah. And so I went, I have to do this. Annoyingly, is, is they knew the first episode had so much interest that it rated through the roof and then sure enough, bang, the next day, hey, we've got another show for you, you know, and it was even worse called Australia's Perfect Couple. Yeah, and, so I'm looking at it, the list now. And so oh, some shock that there. was up in Byron. So that was like a reality dating show and I was like, I don't want to do that. And they're like, you said that about Bowling in the Wall and last night it rated and you were wrong. Well, the next, I said yes to this crap one. The next week, hole in the wall, plummets. And they knew that. And plummets and plummets and plummets. And so at the end of that, I had already said yes to another crap one. So by now I'm, I'm cashing checks that, you know, my credibility can't, you know, <laughs> can't deliver on. So by the end of all of these, people are like, oh, you're the host of all that crap. And so I went, all right, I better go into radio now. Yeah. Do you, do, what was I'm just looking at the list here. What do you reckon was more fun to do? Funniest home videos or 20 to 1? Well, I didn't really host 20 to 1. That was Bert Newton. But I, I think I appeared on it a bit. I don't think I, I might have hosted some. And I, I only, funniest home videos I didn't host long. I, I was just doing like finales with Tony Piran and um, mm. she was a superstar. And th- those were just side things. But I, I sort of did every known genre. And to be honest, I, I like trying new genres. Like, you know, I did um, panel sh- quiz shows, uh, the reality show, a game show, um, travel reporting, red carpet, showbiz, entertainment reporting on Today Show. Like, so I was happy to, uh, I was a VJ on So Fresh. I was happy to collect the set and that's why I think, you know, because I was right then I wanted to be a well-rounded presenter and have done all that experience. And I still love that. Like, um doing all those different angles. I just wish um, most of them didn't go to air. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, look, you, you probably could argue 
then unless you had those moments, you would not have learnt the craft in the way that you did over the years. So you got to have yeah, but the problem you got to have those that, shitty shows. Yeah, but then the point is that it's meant to then get to you to the moment where you like. Then I think the voice came, and like I'd already moved on because it was actually no, it was actually no good TV shows. Like, and there's not really now. So as a TV presenter back then, you know, you could have a career as a TV presenter. Whereas it's not a, there's no, like Tommy Jacket, you know, me and him, we were investing in him to become a TV presenter. For what? Like even on Foxtel, there's like TV presenting isn't a craft anymore, really. I mean, there's there's a couple of people, but you know, that's why they keep using the same people and they're not producing more TV presenters. Like, I don't know, 7, 9 and 10, I might be wrong, but are there, is anyone who, you know, because Sonia Kruger's doing stuff I, and um, Darren McMullen did The Voice. I don't know. Is it, who's, who, and Scotty Cam's doing good stuff, but I, I think they're all just the same people from, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, well, that that is network TV now, isn't it? It's It's reality TV, sport, news rehashing formats that they know works and then syndicated stuff from from who knows cbs viacom or whatever other agreements they have in place i can't think of anything original and yeah i really can't well stable like because you know the problem is you you spend all the you spend all of your like you promote the new thing Mm. come out like you know grant denia does great but the problem is if they're not stable, you end up doing six in four years as a TV presenter and then it, you know, you can't help but wear, like me, um, all of the weak ones as part of your brand. And that's why you look at something like what um, uh, David Barber and, and, and Justin and, um, and Jules Cress with The Block, you know, you look yeah. at these stable shows, these are juggernauts and they are the most powerful things in Australian television in decades and it is a proper brand that is great, it evolves, it's innovative and it, it is television in this country. Yeah. I was thinking about it the other day, like do we, what, what's the original stuff that we see nowadays? The only, like I can't think of a good Aussie original that was produced in the last few yeah. years. Well, the, the so the project was, well, 7 p.m. project. When that first launched, David Mott from Channel 10 showed incredible commitment and discipline because you've got to imagine when you launch something new in this country and it doesn't fit into a pigeonhole, and that was news plus comedy, and it was absolutely uncomfortable. It was unnerving for the people presenting because they would go, here's you know, 3,000 people have been killed in Tehran, you know, and then it would go to Husey to make a gag about something else. And it was pretty difficult and the audience didn't know where to put it. And and it took years to um, for people to just get comfortable with the temperature. And I, I love that because it's still there and these these those programs are important. Um, but then before that was, you know, things like Thank God You're Here and all of the, the mm. D-Gen guys and Working Dog guys that stuff was powerful, brave, and they had the credibility. And same as Rove, and you know there was some great innovations, um, which which you know Rove was turning into the seven pm project. So I think that stuff, yeah, it's really hard to do new stuff and get it to stick. And you know Hamish and Andy have d- done some great stuff, and you know they've even had success overseas with. Um, uh, uh, I always forget if it's real stories or true stories. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Early on, they had they had another concept, real story of the true stories. But um, you know the the caravan of courage and that that um, and that was actually that travelling stuff was actually brilliant. Um, that was how getaway should have been. You know, in many ways, <laughs> it should have been more around entertainment with the 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 location as a backdrop. But I think these days, unfortunately, no one has the commitment that Dave Mott, which is this is different. Let's stick with it because even maps. Married at First Sight, and look, this is as someone who doesn't even watch any of this stuff, this is, um, Maths was very different early days because the producer for that was an old getaway producer and that was plodding along as something more like an obdoc and it was really not tacky, cheesy, disgustingly cheap. Mm. And it, 
it, it was only Adrian Swift, who was also ex-getaway and, and a superstar, who sort of just said, nah, there's, a, there's an appetite for this, but I think we need to, <laughs> we need to make it a bit more, um, I don't know. Frank, Frank and, uh, what do they call it? Frank and Edling or Frank and... Uh, What's that? Never it's where it. it's where you take multiple words from different sentences and stitch together a sentence. Frankenstein. I, Frank, I Frank, and, Frank and clipping. Um, God, I, I really, Friendly Geordies, who's a, a prominent uh, YouTuber these days in Australia, talks about it when he does his reviews of maths and whatnot. Um, but, yeah, it's basically like where they put in something like, he said that I was a bitch. And it's like they never said it collectively as a sentence, but they just made the sentence for drama. I edit stuff like that in my uh, Market Is In Pajamas, my video content series. Not as much as that. I just cut it. But it's, it's, a, lot of, like, it's a lot easier than you think. You oh, know, it's you very can, easy. You can create reality. You've got the same audio channel that's clean. You've got these people being recorded hundreds of hours. You've got every word. Yeah. If you wanted to write the words, and then I suppose, I don't know now if it's all transcript and where you could search for words, you could type in, you know, Jordan and then type in the sentence and it could probably find you 10 variations of cow, or well, probably not cow, that's, <laughs> that's out of the box one, but, you know, um, you know and, then, and you could piece it together and all you're doing is you, you show the back of their head or you show the reaction of someone else. It's really easy. So have they... Is part of the, the sign-off, have they got um, freedom to do that? I, I don't know because there was this whole story of this bloke suing Channel 10 post-season or like in the middle of the season launch. So I, I don't know. I really don't. But I, I guess you could argue from a network perspective, someone suing them is actually great PR because they're going to have a bigger legal budget and... And they're just going to get more eyeballs. So it'll sort of pay for itself, maybe. I don't know. I, I got to say, like, the things that you've spoken about tells me, well, I, I feel like at least with, with Getaway and running the Fifi and Jules Facebook page, it was your gateway drug, but also where you sort of saw the writing on the wall um, in a way because you're getting more views or more engagement on that page than an episode of Getaway. And then you had this real, I don't know, I guess you call it an internal push or probably this, I wouldn't call it an aha moment, but a real push and a pull in a way with, with Jim's battle. And then when he passed it, you know, there was a lesson there, I think, where you would have learnt that you just have to, and you've said it in multiple interviews that I read, you've just got to go out and do the thing, if that makes sense. And I feel like that was sort of the the segue into Tribe. It was a combination of those two moments in your life that would have created the founding for that. Yeah, um, well said. The um, the early lessons from Jim and the Reach Foundation, and you know, I was involved in it for you know ten fifteen years. And look, I, I gorged myself on it like yeah. too much, and that's what I I'm, I'm that's what I do. Right, you know, even the Fifi and Jules period and Fifi and Jules Facebook page and, and investing in social is I got obsessed with it. Right, my wife was in in, um, in labour, uh, having contractions, <laughs> and I was still trying to get edits back to Josh Jansen, yeah. you know, before he was publishing a video on uh, like so <laughs> unhealthy. Um, so, but I've always, but the lessons I suppose from Jim is always just make the most of it. And so, and also just lean into the darkness, the unknown. So um, I've just done that. Whenever I've got an interest, so as you say, the interest was, wow, there's something here in, in social media. And then the, there's the push like, all right, I should probably just um, have a swing at it. And mm. so that's what I do. I, I did graphic design. Then I did life coaching for, you know, whatever, 10 years. Then I did TV for 10 years. I did radio for five years. And now I'm, I'm doing, a, you know, I've started a tech company, which I know, you know, I don't know a lot about this, this space, um, but it sort of hasn't really stopped me. And then, and, then, and then the same now, like I, I'm six years into this and I need it to, I, I'm excited because it's, in the, it's going in the right direction, but I'm impatient and I, I actually need something else. So I'm actually uh, uh, going to teach myself how to, how to throw myself out of a plane for the okay. same reason. 
So um, it's a big, black, terrifying, inconceivable um, uh, mountain to climb that in, you know, three weeks' time or whatever, you, you know, you, you could go from, you know, having skydive strapped to someone to actually throwing yourself out of a plane and landing a parachute. You could do that in nine days. Okay. And so, and so, and the only thing, the only difference, the only way to get there is just to break it up into bites. So you look at this massive thing and you go, there's no way I could ever do that. And then you go, well, other people have done it. So what does it look like in inches? And so um, I'm really just fascinated. I'm fascinated in how you break things up. And I suppose what I'm trying to learn through there, apart from just being able to manage my own fear, because, you know, my relationship with fear is, you know, is a management because it's always there and I've always been, you know, I've always confronted it and I've always had plenty of it and I've always overpowered it at different points, but other times it turns into anxiety and holds me back. And so I'm still playing and kicking around with what fear actually um, what role it should play in my life. And so I think that's really valuable. But um, but uh, more so, I, I, I want to um, I, I want to understand, um, like with Tribe, I want, you know, I would hope that Tribe, there's no reason Tribe couldn't be a billion dollar plus um, solution, right? There's no reason. But to think of that is such a big, massive thing. And it's yeah. like, well, break it up into bites. And so that's what I'm trying to kick around and play with. Is, mm. is the sense of belief um, when something feels inconceivable. Where, where are you at? Um, I mean, this the year must have been interesting. I know um, just a few headline numbers. You found a tribe for those who haven't seen it in 2015. I couldn't find much other info on uh, capital raises, but I think you've raised about five mil or so. Uh, you, you've about, at least done, pardon? About 18. 18. So is that one round or two rounds? Are you on like a series B now or was no, it? No, a- it's a few rounds because it's um and it and it sort of changes. We would have been series B, but in Australia the the amounts of money are so small. So for those joining and, and don't understand how you raise money in the startup world is you get a bit of a sort of angel round or seed round. It's just family and friends give you a little bit of money just to get kick started. And then, you know, so we did that. We raised 765, I think. And then we raised 1.5 and then we raised 5.3 and then we raised some 10 or, um, and the 10 would have been an Australian series B, but really we were now global and 10 is the equivalent of a series A anywhere else. Yeah. So we just did another series A, but a global series A. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so you, you're there now. Um, you know, the first thing I was thinking about is why did Jules go, like apart from the obvious thing of, okay, tech can scale more so you can capture more of the market share and value in this influencer space. And there's no doubt every time I read an article on influence, because we do a little bit of talent uh, management with our agency as well, uh, more on the TikTok side, uh, it's you and Jen Day who are regularly quoted in like the AFR the age, et cetera, around what is happening in the space. And it just had me thinking, like, why did, why go tech and not an agency? You well, know, you're, you're a people guy. You like people. Could you have been another Scooter Derek? Um, is that Scooter? Not, is not it- Scooter Derek. Um, fuck, what's his name? Uh, who's Justin Bieber's manager? Yeah, it was Scooter, wasn't it? Yeah, Scooter, but not Derek. No, Scooter. Scooter Braun. Braun. Yeah. Um, well, I, it's, it's funny. So all through my twenties, um, I actually imagined because don't forget reach was like a community of really talented young people that were actually come through programs and then run them. And so I always, and then I got into TV and radio, got my agents and then realized that there's a lot of young talent out there. And I loved helping other young talent come up. Right, and and that's just a natural progression. People helped me, invested in me. It's really easy. I understand how to pass it on, and you know, to other people. And there's been some fantastic talent that have come out of Reach that have got involved in everything from hip hop to TV producing to on screen to like. There's an Illuminati that has been born out of the Reach <laughs> Foundation. You wouldn't know it, but you know, the Reach um, Mafia. There is, and um, so I always dreamed that I'd have a big just talent agent. 
uh, agency because I wanted to build a network of talented people. So, so I suppose the short answer to what what when I thought about the the opportunity, I just thought I just saw it as a visual um, uh, as an app. I just saw that. Um, yep, I just saw it, it, the workflow more visually because I'd done graphic design. Mm. I just I just imagined when I was having trouble with sponsored posts and agencies were coming through and going through the process, I was like, this really is too many emails. This yeah. is too many coffees. Like I want this to be scaled. And so and don't forget Uber and all these other apps. You just went, oh, it's just a two-sided, an Airbnb. It's just like that. It's for content creators and, and, and brands that need to use them. So, um, and also I just wanted to have greater impact and technology wasn't available in years <clears throat> prior. So agencies, you know, just didn't feel like it was exploiting the opportunities of the time. And so yeah. um, the tech route is mar- far more um, exhausting and slower and more expensive, um, but the rewards are higher. And also, you know, once again, I didn't understand it. Like I couldn't conceive how I could run a tech company. And so that was the exact reason why I decided to do it. Do you think that, I know you've spoken, it's really interesting listening, or sorry, reading this interview when you raised the five mil um, about what the long-term goal is, you know, that you'd expect an exit. And I was thinking, would you really want to exit this? Like I could see him being a lifetimer or a lifer doing this. But then when you talk about the fact that you're, you can get bored of things and then you'll switch your interest into something else. It's, I have a sort of similar thing. So I could sort of see where uh, you would maybe want to exit later down the track. But do you think that in the long term goal that listing this business is something that you'd want to do? Well, the, the exit is important because I don't want to work this hard. Like, so, you know, Jim died at 45 and I'm 41. And he, he, you know, as he said to me, you know, don't get so busy making a living that you forget to make a life. And he, 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 that was his big regret. So I don't want to work like this and uh, I just can't be fucked and it's not a great way to spend your life. So, and money's not that important. So then what are you doing? Because once you've proven yourself and, you know, I'm not doing it for validation, this piece. I mean, I want to validate the concept and I know that, I know that we're on the right track, whether, you know, I know that in, in the next few years, the solution that we've got is just the, is f- huge and it's the only answer to the world's problem around digital advertising. You know, we've spent decades solving the distribution of ads through Facebook and Google, but not the creation of them. And no one can create them. Creative agencies can't create the volume and the variety for and stock image libraries and it's actually their own customers. So though we, we've been in influencer marketing, that's, Influencers are just the first wave of what I think is a great source of this brand of content that where, you know, customers create the ads that customers see. And so yeah. that that's we're actually a brand of content marketplace. Um, anyone should be able to do it. You don't have to have followers to take a photo. You look at anyone's um, camera roll, it's full of brands and products that would be valuable to the brand if only they could access it. So we just want to unlock all of that stuff. It's magazine quality and billboard size. So that's the vision and there's no other solution to the big problem. And so it's going to happen and it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar, you know, it's a massive solution. Are we going to be the ones who are selling it and there? We don't know, but it's going to happen. So I want the validation of getting there, but I also don't want to give up far more invaluable things than that because who cares about a billion, multi-billion? It just gives you more money. What do you do with money? Like yeah. Jim died, he, he bought him, he, he, if he'd saved up all his money over his lifetime. He'd spend it on stuff, but he was still a bit of a tight ass. He finally bought himself a Porsche Cayenne and then a month later he got a tumour in his eye and he was legally unable to drive his own Porsche. It was like, wow. fucking hell. You know, so flipping what? You've got heaps more money. Like enough, you, you know, you want to have enough, right? You want to put your kids through, you know, so they don't have to go to CBC. But... <laughs> That's a dig for my mates, but the um, but you, and you want to travel over the world and 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 see all the great things, so you don't have to need getaway to go and and, and experience the university of life. But um, let's not be stupid about it. And so, right now, do I want to exit it? Yeah, I want to exit it because I, I want to get busy doing stuff. I want to throw myself out of a plane. 
Mm. Well, then let's, before we get into these rapid fire questions to finish off, let's talk about COVID and how that may have blocked what you want to do. Cause you, you gotta, you gotta say, like, if you think about it this year, you can't travel, you can't really experience much inside of your own home, but you can be close with family, I guess, in some way you can still do things like, uh, camping in the living room. Right. Um, what's it been like for you this last six months? Well, look, it's been, you know, my mates call it the mental health Olympics. And so it's, much, yeah. it, it's been that, uh, no question. And the benefits of that is just greater resilience. And, but, but you know, the ability to bounce back, uh, the sensitivity when things go wrong that can throw you more. Um, your ups and downs are extraordinarily frequent. Um, there's, you know, that's what I've and most people has experienced. Um, but the resilience through that is phenomenal. And, look, the benefits far outweigh the negatives. Um, you know, I haven't travelled all year and, you know, I was meant to go to South by Southwest right at the start in, in March and, look, I don't, I, I don't miss it at all. I, I miss um, holidays, you know, travelling for holidays. But I, I've gained so much. I mean, you know, the, the focus in and around your own neighbourhood the focus in and around your small group of friends and, and especially the focus in and around the activities and creativity required to, you know, invest in your kids and, and um, stuff has been amazing. Like, you know, um, as you said, you know, we, we did two camp outs upstairs in our, in, our, in, in our bedroom with the kids where we, you know, the campfire, ghost stories, marshmallows, the Spotify playing thunder, you know, and we and it was awesome on a week, and the girls absolutely loved that. They're you know they're ten and eight, and then you know I've I've bought juggling balls for all of us, and you know we've created some process. I mean the girls aren't into it as much as me, but I'm trying to le- teach them about once again. There's no way you can pick up balls and learn how to juggle unless you do layer by layer. And so I've broken down all the layers with you know check boxes, and um, and the lesson there slowly is that you literally cannot learn how to juggle unless you drop the balls. And so the fact that in life, if you want to, if you want to succeed, you just got to, you, first and foremost, you've got to go, right, how many mistakes I'm going to have and give yourself full permission because it's the exact same thing in juggling. You think you're just going to pick them up and not drop them. So that's one thing I want to lay through. And, um, you know, riding bikes, um, running, uh, exercise with the girls. And, I mean, there's a handful of other things that we've done, scavenger hunts where, you know, we write down, um, and this is Sammy Cab's idea, but you write down sort of 12 things and put points alongside it, things like you've got to find a plane in the air, you've got to find a double pram, you've got to see a cat in someone's front yard, you've got to um, find a dog with, the, with its name starting with B, so they go around and ask strangers, and you've got to take photos of all these things. You've got to find dog shit, so they take photo of dog <laughs> shit, and they get all these points and, uh, and then we go out and reward and they just, you know, you've got time limit and they're in charge. I'm in the car and they go, go this way. And, I, and they just, they control me for two hours. And then I, I said, I'll buy them any book they want. And they go, we don't want it. That was just so much fun. So there's yeah. all of these things that it, it forces you to think, right, how do I invest in them? Make sure that they're getting something enriching. And also what my wife has done in, in creating a little classroom and teaching them, I reckon they've come a further than they would have at school and and that's really oh you know because of the just the attention and and the bond that Anna and Anna's had to really invest in it but you know at the start she was making lunch boxes like get it all put in the lunch box even though they're at home you know they'll get dressed put their clothes on brush their teeth print out the things like real discipline mm. and um and once again invest in their ability to push through things they don't want to do and it's been great so Good. It sounds very exciting. I can't wait to be uh, a parent and come up with little games like that to do. That game sounds fun. To yeah. Get to be honest. And and it, it is. It, it's it's been brilliant. And then also with you know our mates and do our exercise. Getting you know, can't go to the gym, so we've got kettlebells down at Elwood Beach, and you know we'll do that a couple of times a week. And do our, you know no personal trainer because you can't. It's just me and Sammy. And he's just, you know, I'm whinging and he's just yelling at me and playing Beastie Boys music and, you know, trying to maintain some sense of, of normality. 
Um, let's jump into these rapid fire questions to finish you off. Morning and evening routine. What does that look like at the moment? Wake up, don't turn on my phone. Uh, I'll have a shower regardless of if I'm about to go for a run or something just because it wakes me up and it's, a, it's an indulgence. Then I'll go down, turn the, um, the fireplace on, uh, feed the cat because he'll scream at me and then I sit there and meditate for 20 minutes. Um, so I'm doing that twice a day now, uh, TM, which broke uh, the back of a really bad anxiety cycle that I got caught into mm. where I'd hurt my foot jogging one night and then I couldn't run and then I wasn't as tired on the weekend. So I wasn't sleeping on a Sunday night. I'd wake up shit on a Monday and then I'd have anxiety and, I, you know, I'd fight or flight with every email I'd get and then I wouldn't sleep on a Tuesday night and then I was in bad shape. And mm. so and I, it went like that for about six weeks. So... I had to do a four-day meditation course and then exercise and change my diet and I just attacked it, Chinese medicine to fix my guts and all sorts of things. So I've fixed that. So I have this Veda tea, which is, you know, while I meditate and then I, after meditation, sit there for a couple of minutes and then I turn my phone on. And I bash those things out uh, and then I'll uh, have breakfast, cook myself some omelettes, go down and get my coffee and start my day. Then at the end... Um, I try to meditate. Um, yeah, it's a bit messy, you know, eat with the kids, uh, but I, my brain's still wired and thinking about my emails and then I'll put the kid, we'll put the kids to bed and then Anna and I will try and watch TV for an hour and then go to bed about 9, 9.30. What have you been watching recently? Well, fuck it, everything. I mean, from start. <laughs> I mean, I, I watch so much, but I, I, I must be a subscriber of every fucking s Um But uh, at the moment, zero, zero, zero on SBS. Uh, yeah. It's really hardcore. Like it's like narcos on steroids. And then um, Yellowstone with Kevin Costner has been brilliant. Um, that's do, you find, do you find that good or a little cliche? Oh, yeah. Episode three was humiliating. It was just so shit, but then um, I think it's probably going to get better. But I did love Succession and Billions, so no, it's pretty good, but there was one episode which was just stupid. It was just they they had five stupid, unbelievable things happen with one day, and it was just stupid. Yeah, the, the opening to the show is like he's in a car crash. Uh, like that's how I got up to the bit with the, the she's sitting in the bank or they're like threatening some guy and I'm just like oh seems like a bit of a stretch but it was recommended on I think it's Stan because I watched uh, Succession um, we're currently watching uh, Silicon Valley I watched the first three seasons and I've rewatched it for my partner so she can get into it and so we're up to just up to season five now so um I found that pretty good. Yeah, that's fun. That's really good. And it's humiliating again because, you know, when I first watched Series 1, which would have been filmed probably 2010, you know, they're taking the piss. So we're having experiences here in Australia which what what we think is new and fresh and, you know, you watch that that was filmed like five years earlier and they're taking the piss because it's so cliched and common in Silicon Valley, which would have been 10 years earlier and you're sitting in Australia thinking it's like, and you just, <laughs> you just feel like your pants are being pulled down. It's yeah. It's, it's so good, but that is the whole show, right? Like I'm on the season now where it's, they're all taking the piss out of VR. Like, yeah. um, yeah, that is very, very funny. Um, last question for you. A two hundred dollar purchase, anything from two hundred dollars below uh, and below, that's helped you during this period at all. Well, look, the, the the most important thing that's helped me through this period is um, is meditation. But um, I don't know. I, it's hard. It's hard to answer. But I'm I'm just going to say that the book that I keep coming back to is Seth Godin's. It's your turn. And it's not a lot of words. It's a lot of pretty pictures. And, um, <laughs> but it's just, it's just powerful. And on Akimbo, Seth Godin, he's got an episode, um, I think it was January 
uh, January 2019, but uh, but it's one episode called "It's Your Turn," and it and you could what you could listen to it like eight times, and it all talks about uncertainty. And his book is phenomenal. It's basically what to do when it's your turn, and it's always your turn. And it's sort of the philosophy that I suppose I live by, which is just push yourself to the front, and just take it. Right, it's your turn. Yeah. And Sammy Cav is, you know, so Sam was this. I walked into the first reach course when I was 15 after the guys came, to, Jim came to my school and Sam went to CBC and I walked in and walked up to him and said, hey, I'm Jules. He said, hey, I'm Sam. And he's been my best mate ever since, which is, you know, what, what's that, 26 years. And, um, you know, when Jim passed, um, you know, I, I just turned towards Sam because Sam's the most enlightened human I know. He's just, he's like my mentor. He's my age, but he's just so much smarter and everything that he absorbs and looks at and talk, teaches me. And he, and he gave me that book. He bought five of them for people. And then I bought about 15 for the tribe crew because it's one of those things that you, you just want to pass on. It's a stunning message. So well recommended. Uh, there's a lot of good Seth Godin books, but I'd probably rate that one. And uh, what's the other one? Purple Cow? Wow. Yeah. Always, always a classic. Um, Jules, mate, thanks for doing this. I appreciate you sitting down with us. Uh, where can people find you on the interwebs? Well, it's pretty early, so it's at Jules Lund everywhere. Uh, it's easy. And I've got at Tribe everywhere as well, So, uh, which was a miracle. I had to do some hustling to get at Tribe on Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn, but I did. So Beautiful. find that. Um, we'll link all of that, but uh, Jules Lund... Thanks for joining. Thank you, mate. Thank you so much for watching Uncommon and this week's episode. If you like it, smash that like button. If you want to keep up to date with what we're doing, please do subscribe. We would love that. We'd love to build this audience that we're growing here of Uncommoners. Uh, if you want to keep up to date with audio, you can search for us on all of your good podcast apps. It's Uncommon or Uncommon Show will typically find us. For social, you want to see behind the scenes this amazing studio that I'm sitting in, just search at Uncommon underscore show uh, and everything will be there, including our weekly promos. But um, look, thanks so much for stopping by. Until next time, thanks for watching.